Brussels Chatham House event on uh, the Britain's relationship with Asia after Brexit. And um, we're holding this event in collaboration with the uh, Daiwa An Anglo-Japanese uh, Foundation. And um, uh, I'd like to welcome you all to this um, very uh, high-level, interesting discussion we're about to have about uh, the UK and how it will forge its way in Asia and what relationships it can expect or should aim for after Brexit. Uh, we have a very distinguished group of speakers. And um, before, before I uh, hand over to them, I'd just like to uh, tell everyone that this is Chatham House, but we're actually not under Chatham House rules today. This event is on the record, so feel free to tweet and uh, write down what you hear. Um, there is a hashtag, which is uh, hashtag CH events, if you do want to tweet. Uh, I'd like to ask everyone to put their phones on silent, uh, and uh, without further ado, we will, we will start. We're going to have some opening remarks from the speakers, um, and then uh, we will throw it open to questions. So, uh, first up is Charles Grant, who's going to set the scene, and he is the founder and director of the Centre for European Reform. Thank you, Julia. I've gone around, we've got about seven minutes when I get to six and a half, give me a kick. I will. Thank you. Um, well, I'm going to say a little bit about Brexit itself, because that matters for the impact on Asia. Well, I mean, nobody's quite clear what kind of deal it's going to be, but let me stick my neck out and say, I think it'll be what is generally called the hard Brexit, but not as hard as some people think. I believe that it will be a free trade agreement in the long run between the UK and the EU, similar to the Canada-EU free trade agreement. <coughs> but if the British are lucky, a bit more services added on than Canada has achieved. It'll be a very bad deal for the City of London because there will not be passporting for financial institutions in the UK. Um, we will leave the customs union probably, which is very bad for the Japanese car industry present in the UK, because if we don't, don't leave the customs union, Liam Fox's new ministry has nothing to do with the alliance to negotiate free trade agreements with other countries. Uh, we will restrict EU migration, though probably less strictly than migration from other parts of the world. We'll do that to buy a bit of goodwill from our partners. We'll pay money into the EU budget, and there will be a transition deal to cover the long period that may elapse between when we leave the EU in the spring of 2019 and when the future free trade agreement, which will take perhaps five years to negotiate and two years to ratify, if we're lucky, uh, comes <coughs> into effect. So there will have to be a transition deal. But well, that's the optimistic scenario. If you talk to people in the Commission and Council in Brussels, they tell you it may be much worse than that. They're not sure the British could pay the price required for a transition deal, which is accepting free boot of labour in European Court of Justice <coughs> during the transition, in which case the British may reject the transition. That's actually what some of the hardline Brexiteers in the government wish to do, in which case then Britain has a cliff edge. It goes out of the EU, caught by nothing other than WTO rules, uh, which doesn't do anything for our services industries, and even the manufacturers means 10% uh, tariffs, tariffs on car imports and exports, and 50% tariffs on a lot of that farm exports into the EU. So that'll be pretty bad for our economy. So that's, that's, that's the optimistic scenario. We'll get the deals I've outlined, I hope. And what does that, what does that, if I'm right, what does that mean for the EU itself and for relations with other parts of the world? Um, I should just say that one thing it means is the British economy will be smaller than it would otherwise be. No big thing for sure how much smaller that depends on the details which we don't know the answers to. But I think that the biggest cost of the economy is loss of foreign direct investment. I mean, I, I know, and I'm sure people in the room do, there are many examples, not in the public domain, of foreign investors in our industries and our financial firms deciding to relocate or uh, planning to relocate or postponing decisions. That is, that, is, that is just a fact. In the long run, lack of foreign direct investment is a big cost to the British economy. <coughs> The second cost, and the only other one I mentioned now, is uh, companies being able to hire the labour they need to make our economy work smoothly. We have unemployment at 4.8% in Britain. Industries like hotels, hospitals, care homes, uh, bars, restaurants, universities, think tanks, we depend on foreign <coughs> labour, much of it from the EU, and farming, I should say, above all. And so if Mrs. May will introduce a system that reduces the numbers significantly according to her officials. That's what they tell me. If, she's, if that is the case, then there'll be a real cost to our economy in terms of labor shortages. So that's, that's, that's the deal that's going to see it happening. 
Uh, in terms of this, the British, uh, Britain's exit does affect the economic philosophy of the EU as a whole. This is very relevant for companies in Asia. The British have been the biggest <coughs> champions of free trade agreements between the EU and other parts of the world, including championing the Japan EU free trade agreement, which is now coming to fruition, hopefully. They've been the biggest champions of enhancing the single market into new areas like services blocked by France and Germany, or the digital single market as well. And they also believe in science-based policy making. They are the ones who are saying that we shouldn't have the precautionary principle. The British are more like the Americans are saying that, that policy making uh, on food safety and so should be science-based rather than uh, based on fear and precautionary principle. And so in all these ways, the EU economy without the British will be less committed to free trade agreements, less committed to the single market, and less committed to science-based policy making, none of which is particularly good for Asian companies who should operate in the EU. Um, Without the British, EU foreign policy becomes much less credible, losing one, you losing one of its two major powers. Um, I think EU policy on Russia will be quite a bit, maybe softer, though, of course, the arrival of Donald Trump and the probable arrival of Francois Fillon will have a much bigger impact than Brexit. But the, the EU sanctions on Russia may disappear. There'll be less advocacy for Turkey's interests in the EU without the British. Um, and I would now, this is where I come on to finally, really, Asia itself, I think the EU will be less interested in Asia without the British, because the, I was told by French officials last week, the British aren't there, who else is going to tell us to get involved in and interested in Asia? Not so many other European countries are closely involved on at least the strategic side of Asia, though they all like to trade with Asia. Now, I, before I conclude with a very brief comment on that uh, it's itself, just I have to say a word about Donald Trump, because it's relevant for Brexit and the impact of Brexit on other parts of the world. Like the Donald Trump's election means that uh, I think I, I think Donald, Tr Donald Trump's election means that the hardline Brexiteers in Britain want a very clean break with the EU, have have an alternative. They can say, you know, who needs the EU? Who needs close economic ties with the EU? Trump will give us a trade deal, which he will, uh, and so on. Uh, and on strategic matters too, we can do so much with the Americans. Who needs the Europeans? I think this all the, the arrival of Trump probably may, means um, a hardline Brexit than it would otherwise be. Now, um, I do think that um, uh, I do think that the Trump election also uh, also has. A, I was in Washington last week talking about what Trump means for Europe and for Asia, and I picked up three maybes. Only maybes, not certainties, because nobody can be sure for anything certain. One maybe is Trump sees Russia as a possible ally in dealing with China, because he wants to stand up to China. We, we're not sure about that. The conflicting evidence, the call to the Taiwanese president uh, and comments about China's unfair trade practices lead one to believe he may be preparing for a very tough line on China, and he may see a close relationship with Russia, which he's certainly keen on, as a way of uh, taking China, Russia out of China's orbit and, and strengthening his hand against China. That's a maybe. Um, the second, the second maybe, though, of course, which affects Japan and Korea, is uh, maybe he's less committed to the defense of Japan and Korea than, than his predecessors have been. That's a very much a maybe, but he has talked about making them pay more for their defense. And there's some question mark in the Republican think tanks in Washington, which I visited, as to how much he really believes in that. But then a, sort of a contradiction, maybe, my third maybe, is what about North Korea? This is, many people in Washington believe it's the single biggest strategic challenge that the United States and others face in the coming years. Now that North Korea has got missiles that can apparently work some, to some degree, which can have nuclear bombs in them. And maybe the need to handle North Korea means that he will not get tough on China, and he'll have to be very soft on China, because China is the only possible help he can have in putting pressure on North Korea. Um, uh, I don't know about that, but let's just, let's, let's just see. Um, but last word of all, and I'll stop, uh, on the EU in Asia. I've already said that the EU will be less strategic without the British. And I think if, if Trump, as I wish my personal view is, does take a harder line on China than perhaps the Obama administration has done, that will create dilemmas for the European Union and its actions in Asia. Because already under Obama, there's been tension on the side of the China Sea incidents, with the US <coughs> wanting the Europeans to take a tougher line than the Europeans felt comfortable in doing. Many European countries, not particularly the Brits, many European countries are so keen to trade with China. They don't want to annoy the Chinese. They've been very soft in their reactions to, for example, a ruling on the, 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 the international arbitration, not ruling in favor of the Philippines. 
The European Union didn't react to that at all, because it didn't want to say anything that might upset the Chinese. So there was already tension between Americans and Europeans and how to handle Asian strategic issues. And if Trump goes from hard aligned against the Chinese, as he might, but we don't know, then I think there's quite a possibility that the Europeans will, um, will have a, see the merits, of, they will see the merits of taking a different way <coughs> from Americans, a more, a more pro-Chinese position to differentiate themselves from the Americans for economic benefits, because most European governments really only care about economics when it comes to, to China. And that may not be so good for the EU's relationship with other countries like Japan, but we'll, we'll wait and see. I've probably gone on a slightly too long, sorry for that last one. We were right on time. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and now uh, we are going to hear from uh, Fuji Sia, who is the uh, representative, uh, high representative of Singapore in the UK. Well, I think I, I would just give you three points, and um, we'll start with something that's fairly provocative, which is really about Singapore and the UK. Um, we, are, we are very used to being a price taker, being a very small country. Um, so we are not going to speculate about what kind of threat it, it will be. Um, <coughs> Singapore is prepared for whatever kind of new relationship we need to enter into uh, once the UK is ready and willing um, to discuss those arrangements with us. Um, I think with Brexit, the immediate question that confronts us is really what happens to the EU-Singapore free trade agreement of which, at this point in time, the UK continues to be part of. Um, and the EU-Singapore Free Trade Agreement is currently um, put to the European Court of Justice to decide on the issue of competency. And once that issue is decided, it will then presumably be subjected to ratification um, by the different um, national and regional parliaments. Um, we think that the EU-Singapore Free Trade Agreement, quite apart from it being mutually beneficial to Singapore, to the EU, is in particularly beneficial to the UK um, and on the services front. So through Brexit, I think there is a certain loss of um, what could have recruited the UK um, from the EU Singapore Free Trade Agreement. Um, the trading arrangements between Singapore and UK are of course very strong. It is, um, but at the same time, UK is not our largest trading partner in the EU. Uh, it is actually the fourth largest trading partner after Germany, Netherlands, France and the UK. Uh, on the investment front, which I think um, is, to me, a much more important indication of the nature of the economic relationship which Charles spoke about, um, of course, historically, the UK has been a very strong investor into Singapore and in very important strategic areas that um, we are interested in, in advanced manufacturing, uh, pharmaceuticals, line sizes, and that are very important, has been growing very strongly. Uh, what is interesting is that the Singapore inward investment into the UK in the last 10 years has been growing um, from strength to strength. It has been growing at more than 10% um, every year, until just before um, the new referendum. Um, and as much as we continue as the government to promote the UK as an investment destination, I think businesses make their own decisions. Uh, and while UK has traditionally been our second most popular investment destination, and we have become a fairly large investor overseas, uh, so much so that we are in fact the largest foreign investor in China, uh, outside Hong Kong and Taiwan. Um, and UK used to be the number two most popular investment destination for our companies. Um, in 2014-2015, in there was a very significant drop in our investment coming to the UK by almost 30%. Um, such that the UK has fallen from number two to number six of our investment destination. And I think you might see more of that as businesses look at uncertainty um, and deciding what they might or might not want to do. Uh, uh, but nonetheless, I think at the governmental level, we are always supportive and want to be helpful to the extent that we can. Uh, and the Prime Ministers have spoken at the G20 summit in Hangzhou uh, about the importance of really having some kind of discussion uh, post-Brexit. Um, so that's really about Singapore, but um, I wanted to just bring the discussion larger to look at what are the opportunities. And I think one of the opportunities is that um, you know, we, we are looking at the UK as it pronounces its very pro-globally um, engaged um, trade advocacy role that um, the Fox, for example, wants to play. That it is, in fact, a potential opportunity for the UK to fill the gap uh, that might be dictated uh, by others as, as they withdraw 
um, from the global trading system. And if you really go back slightly in history, um, you know, of course, Singapore, which has trade, which is 300% of our GDP, is absolutely dependent on trade. Uh, we are a strong supporter of a global trading system through the WTO. We hosted the first ministerial conference in 1996, um, and we do want the WTO to succeed. Uh, but in the absence of the WTO making any headway, you have to be, we are too small to be ideological, so we need to be quite <laughs> uh, So in the late 1990s, we decided that uh, with no movement in the Doha round, uh, the alternative is to really look at bilateral and plurilateral trading arrangements. Uh, so we have entered into free trade arrangements with most of our trading partners, uh, and we created, some might not have heard, um, what eventually turned out to be the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement when um, looking around the world, we saw the European Union at the point of time being a very successful project. Um, we saw the Americas through NAFTA um, potentially being expanded to the free trade area of the Americas. Um, and Asia, of course, had our own trading arrangement that was being discussed. Um, and Singapore, as a global trading nation, really wanted the world to be engaged and not broken down into, into parts. So we started what used to be called the Pacific Four, together with three other very small economies, New Zealand, Brunei, and Chile, to create the link um, from Asia across the Pacific to the Americas. Um, and this P4 has been in existence, and this seed that we have planted for a very long time. Uh, and eventually, in 2008, uh, the outgoing Bush administration decided that they would join it. Uh, and then it became the Trans-Pacific Partnership. We worked very hard to get others like Vietnam, Malaysia, and Japan on board. Um, and together with TTIP, um, TPP and TTIP was really intended to form um, a very large part of the move towards greater trade liberalization. Because you could imagine uh, world trade as a jigsaw puzzle, um, with many different sets of jigsaw puzzles mixed together. Um, and if you have significant pieces, if you build a jigsaw puzzle, significant pieces that are built together, the smaller pieces can then fit in. So if we have a big piece um, between the Pacific, in the, in, through the Pacific, between Asia and, and, and Americas, if you have a big piece between Americas across the Atlantic to Europe, then you have a large part of the jigsaw puzzle that is really built, um, and the rest can, can fit in, and that was really um, our aim um, and our part to play a larger role um, in creating that international trading system because um, in terms of TPP, actually Singapore has very little to gain um, individually as a country from the TPP because we have bilateral free trade agreements with most of the remaining 11 partners. Um, we only don't have it with Mexico and Canada, they're not major trading partners to us. And hence it was really for strategic reasons that we pushed the TPP. Um, similarly, there is a framework in Asia called the Regional Closer Economic Partnership for our staff. Um, and studies have shown that Singapore had the least benefit, um, but nonetheless we pushed for it because we felt that it was an important initiative to bring um, kind of trade liberalisation to, to a high, higher plane. Um, and we think we, and we hope that the UK would be able to develop its own domestic consensus, which we understand is difficult in many parts of the world, um, to really continue to be a key advocate uh, for continue to, to, to push for trade liberalisation, whether individually, in the WTO, or globally, uh, with like-minded countries, and there are suggestions for, for example, UK, Australia, uh, New Zealand, Singapore, or perhaps Malaysia under the Five Power Defence Arrangement, uh, to come up with a new arrangement and a new seat uh, for greater trade liberalisation. And my, my final point is really about the domestic consensus, and I think it, it's challenged uh, across the world, um, with uh, Prime Minister Theresa May's um, push to have an economy that works for everyone um, is something that I think is very important if we want to continue to have support for, um, for, for these issues. Um, something that Singapore has been looking at for a very long time um, and this is the kind of dialogue and conversation we really need to have um, to look for future areas of collaboration and opportunities. Thank you. Uh, now we will hear from uh, Mr. Koji Tsuruoka, uh, the ambassador from Japan. Uh, thank you. <coughs> um, a few points. Uh, uh, first, uh, on what uh, Charles mentioned in the beginning, at the outset, uh, what the customs union can and cannot do. Uh, I agree. If uh, UK 
maintain customs union with EU after Brexit, the UK tariffs uh, with the other countries will have to be the same uh, that the EU uh, maintains. And therefore, UK will not be able to negotiate its own tariff rates with other countries. That is true. This is what WTO demands members to do. But there is also an option of having a free trade area, which is not customs union, but it is more expansive uh, economic integration arrangement among regions or uh, bilateral as well. Uh, when you have a free trade agreement, a free trade area agreed and recognized, approved by the WTO members, you can have your own tariffs negotiated bilaterally or plurilaterally with others. So Japan and Singapore, for that matter, has a number of different uh, countries uh, partnering in WTF free trade agreement. And uh, uh, once you have a free trade agreement, the, the tariff rates that Japan applies to the, the other partner is much more preferential than the one we have for the WTO members. The WTO member are required to have most favored nation treatment for the WTO members, but there is exception if it complies with this requirement of achieving a free trade area. It doesn't have to be, it is beyond more than customs union. So on that basis of exception, we have had a number of free trade agreements, including Singapore, in the case of Singapore, for tariffs, it's easy because they don't have tariffs. So it is WTO and it is uh, already zero. So uh, for them, uh, they don't have any problem. But if UK chose to have free trade area uh, negotiated by that belief with others, like the one uh, Charles mentioned with Canada, for example, they will be at liberty of uh, uh, conducting negotiation with others uh, on their own tariffs. So if the uh, UK had uh, a Canada type of an agreement with EU, that means UK will be able to conduct free trade agreement negotiation with other parties around the world. So this is going beyond customs union. It has to be more <coughs> integrating and more comprehensive. It is, cannot be just picking the sectors you like. It has to cover all trade and all economic activities. But still, there are hundreds of those that have already been signed, approved, and then admitted as uh, an exception under WTO. So there is no uh, rule that prohibits the uh, UK from conducting <coughs> the separate bilateral agreements if they achieve a Canada type or free trade agreement type of an agreement with EU. That's a objective point uh, that I think has been not necessarily well addressed in the Brexit uh, discussion. That means, uh, of course, uh, uh, Minister uh, uh, of Trade, uh, International Trade, will have a huge load of work uh, even after uh, concluding negotiations with the EU. Now, on the, the Asian uh, aspect of uh, Brexit, uh, I am, uh, at this moment, quite encouraged by the growing attention of the UK in Asia. It may, sound it may sound paradoxical because, of course, the main focus of attention should be Europe. But uh, we've seen, as you may see in the press today, uh, Chancellor Hammond is in Japan, is in Tokyo, meeting with the uh, counterparts and uh, relevant officials. Um, there was uh, twice visit by Ministry of, uh, I mean, uh, Secretary of uh, uh, Industry and uh, Economy, uh, Greg Clark, twice in Japan since uh, Prime Minister May took office, and uh, the Minister, uh, Secretary in charge of Health, uh, Jeremy Hunt, was also in Japan, and he met with a number of pharmaceutical companies <coughs> together, also with the Japanese Health Minister. Um, uh, Secretary uh, Grayling was also in Japan um, in discussing transport issues. So there's been a series of uh, secretaries' visits to Japan even in the last half a year or so, 
which I think uh, is an evidence of uh, a strong interest the UK continues to hold to do business with Japan. And I think this is particularly noteworthy because this comes at a time when the UK had been focusing attention in Europe, and I don't need to tell you how many visits uh, the, the Secretary uh, Johnson made to uh, Europe, or the Prime Minister may, made to Europe. But in the meantime, the other minister, secretaries have had the time and the energy to go and discuss these issues with Japan. So this is a welcoming uh, positive trend that I continue to see, and I just hope that when the Brexit negotiation starts, the energy and attention will continue to be even expanded and not be diverted because of the busy negotiations with Europe. <coughs> and we are welcoming that. Now, why is this important? The most important uh, aspect of uh, Japan-UK uh, collaboration or uh, partnership, I believe, is to continue to promote the rules that have made economic prosperity today possible. That is, stability and credibility. The private sector are not motivated to do business if they see instability. Uh, they don't have luxury of spending without assurance that they will be making profit. And for that, stability and predictability is a prerequisite. How do you do it? <coughs> Democracy and rule of law. These are the basis for global prosperity. And we know by our own experience, <coughs> not just limited to Japan, but the last 70 plus years, have been built on those bases. And Japan and the UK have been the two countries that have worked very hard to promote those basic values that are indeed the structural framework for global prosperity. And we will continue to do so. And it is our hope that the UK, coming out of the EU, as Charles had mentioned, EU, in certain cases, can be very protectionist. Look at the tariff they impose on cars. It's 10%. 10% on top of cars that are being brought from abroad. Of course, it's not going to be very competitive when it is imported. The Japanese auto tariff was eliminated in 1978. That's close to 30 years. We thought others would follow. Never. No country that produces car has ever eliminated tariffs on auto yet. So we are hoping that it will happen. And with the UK out of EU, I'm sure we'll be a much better partner for Japan to work together to promote, to promote those <coughs> values and those principles of free market economy. And I join my colleague from Singapore that uh, the market economy and free trade that allows all the private sector to be more active and engaged is going to be the key for continuing global prosperity. Again, in the 1980s, we heard a lot about uh, protectionism, the endangering prosperity in the world. So we had to push back. The world at the time was roll back protectionism. And that's how the Uruguay round was started. Sorry, history may be repeating itself. We may have to do the same. Uh, we worked very hard to roll back protectionism and therefore start being guru by around uh, during those days. Perhaps uh, Japan and UK, and Singapore I'm sure will be joining us, should be countries that will lead, again, to promote free trade, because this is what the world prosperity depends on. Lastly, just one word on uh, what we see as, uh, a, again, a very important element for the UK being successful, not just in Brexit, but as it uh, uh, addresses all the global issues, including global economy. The important element that the uh, UK needs to have is a unified position that is supported widely by the general public. If a country is divided, the negotiating position is very weak. Voices will be mixed, and message will be not single. If you don't speak in single voice, your voice not heard. And therefore, 
having a unified view after very extensive discussion and having a common understanding of what the objective should be and what are the means to achieve them is the key to have the UK view prevail. Unity based on strong consensus is going to be the key for the success of Brexit. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now we'll hear from uh, David Lynn, who is representative of the Taipei Representative Office mm -hmm. in the UK. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm very, very delighted to be here on, on this very special occasion. So on Brexit, uh, according to all my uh, friends, so there are different uh, possibilities and also scenarios and also uncertainties. But however, in the process of Brexit negotiation, uh, the UK will uh, face new challenges and new opportunities in forging the best possible trade deal or new partnership with the European Union. On the other hand, the UK needs to explore uh, more opportunities in developing or advancing closer trade and investment ties with non-EU countries across the world, especially its major trading partners. So in light of Asia's economic dynamism, it is expected that the Brexit process will have significant implications for the UK's major trading partners in Asia, including Japan, Singapore, and Taiwan. In fact, the UK may have already launched or planned to launch preliminary talks for free trade deal with some country in the region. Uh, I'm very delighted to present Taiwan's perspective so Taiwan always sees the European Union as the most important economic partner and has done everything possible in forging closer partnership with the UK and other EU member states. As a major trading nation uh, with a GDP exceeding 520 billion US dollars uh, in 2015 and also a member of WTO, so Taiwan actually has already developed a strength in outbound investment high-tech in industry cluster, R&D capabilities, competitiveness, and innovation to promote economic and trade cooperation with the EU, uh, including the, uh, the, the UK. Taiwan and the UK actually have long established a robust partnership in trade and investment, and we trust that this trend will continue. Taiwan has been ranked among the UK's 14 key markets for exporting uh, EC products since 1998. Given the trade volume totally around 5.6 billion in 2015, the UK actually is Taiwan's number third largest trading partner in Europe, while Taiwan is the UK's sixth largest trading partner in Asia. In addition, the UK currently is Taiwan's fifth largest source of foreign direct investment, with accumulative investment reaching over 7.6 billion US dollars. So there are about 300 uh, British companies operating in Taiwan. Thank you. So at the same time, the UK attracts most of Taiwan's direct investment into the European Union, uh, and over 180 Taiwanese companies are now operating in the UK. So therefore, it is obvious that both Taiwan and UK will benefit greatly from closer economic cooperation in the areas where all potentials can be identified, including trade investment related agreements. So here I just want to make three very brief points. Number one, that we are hoping, uh, so uh, after Brexit, or even in the process of Brexit, we got to see actually more progress uh, in uh, Taiwan-UK uh, partnership. Number one, we like to see uh, enhanced Taiwan-UK trade and investment <coughs> relations, creating an opportunity for FTA or EIA. Uh, based on the existing economic partnership between the two countries, we believe that a Taiwan-UK FTA or BIA will be mutually beneficial. 
Uh, we therefore will continue to propose some joint feasibility studies or creating a working group uh, for preliminary exchanges between Taiwan and, and the UK. For instance, actually Taiwan and Singapore have already concluded our FTA. Taiwan and Japan have also uh, concluded a, an investment agreement. So I think we are looking forward to more uh, progress in that regard. Secondly, we'd like to expand Taiwan-UK substantive cooperation in some specific areas. Actually, we already have some annual, uh, you see, uh, changes and platforms uh, for uh, further uh, consultation. For instance, we have the annual consultation on economics and trade. We have the renewable energy uh, roundtable, and we have the railway industry forum. But there are specific areas with huge potentials uh, for both countries to further explore the possibility of cooperation, such as offshore wind power, <coughs> digital communications, smart cities, biotechnology, etc. So in all those areas, we do foresee uh, more cooperation uh, in substance. Thirdly and finally, we like to see the UK uh, in the future to develop a new uh, sustainable and comprehensive and mutually beneficial strategy toward Asia. Uh, we feel that, you see, most likely the EU will continue to be the biggest trading partner for uh, UK. But at the same time, the UK can also play a very important role in the future through developing such an Asian strategy, especially interacting uh, with all the major uh, you see, partners in the Asia Pacific region. So we are hoping that this is such a new Asian strategy that will be in shape in the near future. Uh, during his recent visit to Taiwan, the UK's Minister of State for International Trade, Greg Hans, reassured that the UK will continue to be a reliable ally and trusted partner. Now here I'd like to quote, the UK has always been a hub of creativity and innovation, and I want Taiwan to know how we are open for business and will continue to be a reliable ally and trusted partner. We want to seize the opportunities open to us and we'll push <coughs> the strongest possible economic links with all important partners around the world, including with Taiwan. So we welcome this statement. We are also hoping that in the new strategy, strategy toward Asia, uh, there will be more opportunities for all major economic partners um, in the Asia-Pacific. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you very much.